Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Jay Watson is Howard Professor of Faulkner Studies and Professor of English at the University of Mississippi, where he has taught since 1989 and directed the annual Faulkner and Yatna Patafa Conference since 2011. He is the author of three books, most recently, William Faulkner in the Faces of Modernity, an editor or co-editor of 11 volumes, including the forthcoming Faulkner and Slavery, due out in 2021. He is currently at work on a monograph, Fossil Fuel Faulkner, Energy, Modernity, and the U.S. South, from which this year's conference talk is excerpted. Please join me in welcoming Jay Watson. Thanks very much, Betty Jo, for that lovely introduction. Um, it's nice to be here, everybody. It's great to be here with you, although I can't see you yet, but uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll remedy that a little bit later on. Um, before I get going, I, I have some more thanks uh, that I would like to share. Um, I want to express my gratitude to Emily Williams for all the hard work she's done organizing this conference. Uh, I have a little experience with conference organizing and directing myself. Um, I know it's thankless work, and so I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for your thankless work. I think especially this year when we face um, all the challenges of meeting in ways that we wouldn't necessarily prefer and that uh, present a lot of uh, technological difficulties and challenges for us. So Emily, thanks so much. Um, I want to thank Alan Richard, uh, my tech guy, who I, I met a few minutes ago, and I, I already feel like I'm in great hands uh, for the next 50 minutes or so. And then I want to thank, I know there are a lot of people back there that I have not met and not seen in the run-up uh, to this talk who nonetheless make this festival possible. And I want to thank you all, too, uh, for your hard work. I've, I've been on the ground in Natchez for some of these festivals before. I know what wonderful events they are. I know how frustrating it must be for you guys not to get to share your amazing hospitality on the ground with us um, this year, but please know that even, even remotely, I really appreciate it. So for the past 15 years or so, I've been teaching a class on Southern environmental writing in our environmental studies minor at the University of Mississippi, which has been one of the most rewarding, one of the funnest classes that I've ever taught in what I probably shouldn't admit is now a 30 plus year career. As you might suspect, William Faulkner, whom I'm allowing to drop in on the proceedings today, William Faulkner pops up from time to time in this class. Actually, uh, if I'm gonna be honest about it, he pops up all the time in this class where he's joined by a gallery of authors and musicians, visual artists and filmmakers who've turned their eyes and ears to the natural landscapes and the human ecologies of the South. Just the Mississippi artists that I regularly teach in this class would include Charlie Patton, Richard Wright, William Alexander Percy, Walter Anderson, Larry Brown, Jesmyn Ward, and my wonderful colleague, Ann Fisher Worth, who I hope is in the audience and who directs the environmental studies program at the University of Mississippi. Like a lot of educators and scholars in environmental studies these days, I'm becoming increasingly interested in how questions surrounding energy are coming to bear on key environmental issues like climate change, toxic waste, and habitat loss. And since my primary focus as a Southern literature specialist is on Faulkner, I've been thinking a lot lately about the role of energy in his work, which as it turns out, is an under-researched and under-discussed subject uh, in what we could call Faulkner studies. So I've been thinking about the help that, a, that an emerging discipline called the energy humanities can give us in opening those questions up to deeper reflection. My goal today is to introduce you kind of unsystematically to a few places in Faulkner's life and in his Mississippi world and in his writings where energy and particularly fossil fuel energy figures in significant and often surprising ways. And if you happen to know Faulkner's work pretty well, I know a lot of you out there do, you're a knowledgeable audience. If you know Faulkner's work pretty well and you're still having difficulty envisioning where a talk like this might go, well, that tells me I'm onto something. So let's share the screen here, uh, bring up a PowerPoint, make sure my buttons work. Yeah, they're gonna work, fantastic. 
So let's spend a little time just talking about what the energy humanities are anyway. The energy humanities join other contemporary disciplines like the medical humanities, the digital or legal or environmental humanities in turning to literature and history, philosophy and religion in the effort to understand the complex issues that shape human living. As energy scholars argue, every energy regime, every energy system is the result of extensive imaginative work. This work helps identify particular kinds of resources like coal or wood or particular phenomena like wind and sunlight as potential energy sources. This work envisions the use of energy in specific human settings. It anticipates the technical challenges of producing and distributing and consuming energy resources. It reconciles the risks and rewards of the energy system to our existing social and ethical and even emotional norms. This work explores the utility and value of the system to its users. This kind of imaginative work, in other words, renders an energy system thinkable. It allows us to practice it. It renders it conscionable. And by the same token, considerable imaginative resources are required to think across energy transitions from one regime to another, to imagine a way out of one and into the next regime, to think through their preconditions, their consequences and their implications, and to connect these regimes to the felt reality and meaning of human lives. Every form of energy then is supported by stories, figures of speech, feelings, images, and symbols that midwife it into possibility, legibility, even sometimes inevitability. Conversely, the narrative artifacts and expressive acts that are the stock and trade of the humanities are conditioned by what the great scholar and my former mentor, Patricia Yeager, called an energy unconscious, which informs not only their content, but their medium. You might think here of the orders of muscle, steam, and electric power that shored up different versions of print culture, or the petroleum complex that has propped up Hollywood cinema for nearly a century, the fossil fuel generated electricity that makes the internet go. So any effort to reform or overturn existing energy regimes is inevitably going to rest on a scaffolding of new fictions, figures, and metaphors that will lend coherence and purpose to the emerging new regime, to, where, to wherever we wind up going next. Understanding these processes is essential to responsible energy citizenship and will require an interdisciplinary toolkit that includes a full measure of resources and methods from the humanities. So these questions have preoccupied an impressive gallery of literary and film critics over the past two decades. And I'm not gonna rattle these names off here. I'm gonna just let you kind of take them in. Other key figures from recent scholarship and activism in energy humanities include philosophers, historians, and journalists like the ones you see listed here. Other allies work outside traditional humanities disciplines, geographers, political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, ecologists, geologists, and even strategic planners. All of these scholars demonstrate that the aesthetic dimensions and the ideological dimensions of our human relationships to energy are just as important as the technological, economic, or geopolitical dimensions. So now let's learn a little bit about what I'm gonna call the fossil fuel Faulkners. Born in 1897, William Faulkner had a front row seat for key developments in the energy history of the South. And he had a sharp eye for the economic repercussions, the social implications and the cultural networks associated with changing energy regimes in his Mississippi hometown. Faulkner came by this awareness honestly because it began right at home. The novelist's great grandfather, for instance, William Clark Faulkner, uh, the figure that everybody in the family called the old colonel, he founded a railroad, the Ship Island, Ripley, and Kentucky Line, which by the 1880s had come to employ coal-burning steam locomotives, a new technology that helped relieve the burden on southern forests that had been taxed with supplying fuel for the wood-burning boilers of older engines. The Faulkners were thus front and center in their region's energy regime change from wood to fossil fuels. Faulkner's son, J.W.T. Faulkner, the uh, Oxford Faulkner they called the young colonel, 
continued this modernizing work on relocating the family seat to Lafayette County in 1885. Though he inexplicably, inexplicably sold a still hugely profitable railroad in 1902, the move freed up capital for other forward-looking ventures like starting a bank, founding a telephone company, and installing a motor in a rubber-tired buggy to create the very first automobile in Oxford, Mississippi. JWT's son, JWT III, the novelist's Uncle John, supervised the family sale of a corner lot in downtown Oxford to the Standard Oil Company in 1927 for $10,000. That was a not inconsiderable sum at the time. Standard built a gasoline filling station on this lot and one of its subsidiaries, Chevron, maintains a station there to this very day. Uh, this the place is famous for some of the best fried chicken in Oxford. And it's right there where the, where the grandfather used to live. The exception to this family rule was the novelist's father, Murray Faulkner. Murray seemed destined for a career with the family railroad where he worked his way up from coal stoker to engineer to conductor before his father's sudden sale of the business, which was a blow from which the son never really recovered. Called to Oxford to join his father and brother around the time of the sale, Murray lacked their Midas touch as a businessman, and in comparison with his progressive kinsmen, he was behind the energy times. In 1902, for instance, and this is, you gotta remember, the dawn of the automobile age in America, Murray established a transfer company for passengers and freight by buying a livery stable whose owner had the sense to get out of the business and change with the changing times. Not so Murray. In 1911, the year of the breakup of the Standard Oil Trust, he entered into his own arrangement with Standard, but not to sell gasoline or motor oil, but instead to sell kerosene for oil lamps, a throwback to Standard's infancy when petroleum was in demand primarily as illuminant, right, as a fuel for oil lamps. As Faulkner's biographer Joseph Blotner kindly puts it, Murray's kerosene dealership was not a very pro propitious enterprise at the outset of urban electrification in Oxford. And nor was another venture in which Murray offered buggies for sale, even as his father was motoring around the town square in his new Buick touring car. By 1912, Murray was running a hardware store, not unlike the aggrieved hardware clerk whose voice erupts from the pages of The Sound and the Fury, Jason Compson, who like Murray is another son of an elite North Mississippi family who felt slighted and misunderstood by his father. Indeed, Jason's constitutional aversion to gasoline, which gives him blinding migraines in section three of The Sound and the Fury, it might be William Faulkner's tongue in cheek commentary on his father's headaches with the coming of fossil fuel modernity to Oxford, Mississippi. The novelist's mother, in fact, once commented to an interviewer that Jason Compson's voice on the pages of The Sound and the Fury was a dead ringer for Murray Faulkner's actual speaking voice. Now, young Billy Faulkner, and he didn't have the U in his name back then, young Billy Faulkner eased himself into this world's changing energy regimes more gracefully than Murray if also more fitfully than his other Faulkner ancestors. As a child, he had delighted in shoveling coal into the bright hot firebox of number 849, a locomotive from the family fleet that remained in service years after the sale of the company. As a teenager, he was assigned the task of laying in coal every night to keep the family fireplaces supplied, a duty he managed to dodge kind of Tom Sawyer style by entertaining a neighborhood boy with stories in exchange for the chore. Faulkner also witnessed the volatility and risk of petro-modernity as it came to Mississippi. In 1926, the year the young novelist returned to Oxford from New Orleans, a catastrophic fire destroyed a local gasoline refining plant, a spectacle to rival the gushers, blowouts, and explosions that were already coming to dominate the imagination of oil in modern American popular culture. Now these family energy histories were embedded in important regional and statewide histories. The 20th century brought an end to the stranglehold of middle Atlantic states like Pennsylvania on the US energy industry, thanks in large part to the nation's Southern regions. Coal production gradually moved southward from Pennsylvania into the bituminous coal regions of Appalachia, West Virginia, Kentucky, southwestern Virginia, eastern Tennessee. 
The oil patch followed a more direct, a more indirect route south, excuse me, with Ohio and Indiana and California assuming interim roles as production leaders till turn of the century bonanzas in Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana planted U.S. oil extraction and refining squarely and for many, many decades in the greater south. Oil, exp oil exploration picked up in Mississippi as well, accelerating after World War I with the publication of a bullish article in the U.S. Geological Survey Bulletin of in, uh, 1916. Oil fever arrived in Faulkner's home county of Lafayette in 1920, following promising reports from nearby Chickasaw County. The appearance of a pair of Texas prospectors in the area inspired two Oxford businessmen to invest in the fledgling North Mississippi Oil and Development Company. And these would-be uh, petrocapitalists, Joe Parks and J.E. Avant, were later thought by many local people to be models for the infamous Flem Snopes, who's the arch entrepreneur in all of Faulkner's Yachnipatawpha County. Within months, though, the Oxford Eagle, the local newspaper, pronounced this oil play a bunco game that left the gullible holding mineral leases not worth the paper they are written on. In the meantime, the state capital of Jackson had emerged as the epicenter of fossil fuel fever in Mississippi. Major gas wells blew in in the winter and spring of 1930, and the first oil well to strike crude in the state came in two years later. The excitement in the state's capital city prompted the legislature's decision in 1936 to appropriate funds to drill for oil and gas on state-owned lands in the area, which made Mississippi the first state in the nation to exploit its fossil fuel resources directly and with public funds. Now, three major finds propelled Mississippi into the nation's top 10 oil producers by 1945 right around the midpoint of William Faulkner's career as a novelist. In 1939, the Tinsley Field in Yazoo County, near the southern tip of the Mississippi Delta, became the first commercially important oil pool in the southeastern United States. By 1941, Tinsley had mounted to the third highest producing field among all oil fields in the nation. Early in 1944, Gulf Oil christened the Heidelberg Field in Jasper County, which turned a dying sawmill hamlet in the southern part of the state into a boom town. Farther south, in November of the same year, it was Gulf again that sank the discovery well of the Baxter, uh, Baxterville Field in Lamar County, which would become the largest in the state's history. The 1940s became the high water mark for oil, prospects, oil prospecting in Mississippi history. And this includes, you might be surprised to find out, some prospecting on William Faulkner's own property. In March of 1938, Faulkner had invested a share of the windfall from the film rights to his latest novel, The Unvanquished, in a 320-acre farm in eastern Lafayette County. He christened the property Greenfield Farm. There he installed several African-American tenants and set his brother John to work supervising, of all things, a mule breeding operation. Working with Lafayette County Chancery Court records, literary critic Gary Bertolf has recently discovered that just nine months after acquiring Greenfield Farm, Faulkner entered into an oil and gas mining lease agreement with a man named W.L. Stewart for the purpose of prospecting and drilling for and producing oil and gas and other minerals laying pipelines, building tanks, storing oil and building power stations, telephone lines, and other structures thereon. And if that sounded like legal language, that was indeed language that came verbatim from the lease agreement with W.L. Stewart. In 1942, Faulkner entered into a similar agreement with a man named Kennard Cook, presumably after his original lease with Stewart had expired. These leases granted extraordinary leeway to Stewart and Cook to alter, to alter radically the physical landscape and built environment of the farm. They could install derricks, pumps, pipelines, storage tanks, and power stations if exploratory efforts justified investments like that. It's easy enough to imagine Faulkner gleaning insights into oil geology and technology and even the oil business from the discussions with Stewart and Cook that must have taken place on the way to these leases. Now, Faulkner might be forgiven his oil fever, 
that 1938 through 1942 period, after all, marked the pinnacle of Mississippi petroleum extraction and exploration. As historian John Ezell has documented, the year 1940 saw mineral leases and options on Mississippi lands growing to more than one third of the entire state's 30 million acres. So this was going on everywhere, right? Faulkner was kind of, he was tapping into a, a real Mississippi moment. So rightly or wrongly, since no well ever blew in for Faulkner or anyone else in the area, Lafayette County proved an attractive field for oil speculators during these years, William Faulkner included. This rich Mississippi and Faulkner petro history has for the most part eluded or just failed to interest scholars who work on Faulkner's writings. But it didn't fail to interest Faulkner himself, whose fiction came to exploit its own underground riches, subtly tracing the work of prehistoric carbon in powering up modern Mississippi and the modern imagination. So this little section is called Faulkner in Modernity's Basement. Critic Bob Johnson has coined the phrase modernity's basement to describe the thousands of boiler rooms, furnace rooms, and engine rooms where fossil fuels fed the steam engines and internal combustion engines that turned drive shafts, generated electricity, and propelled trains and ships along modern transportation routes. As it happens, Faulkner knew a thing or two about modernity's basement, having done a stint of his own there late in the year 1929. On returning from his summer long honeymoon with his wife Estelle, he found work at the University of Mississippi powerhouse, shown pictured here in these old photos, where he hired on to supervise the night shift. A close inspection of the powerhouse before its demolition in 2016 suggests that coal was loaded from railroad cars along a spur line that you can see here into the basement at the rear of the building where it was then fed into a large boiler. Steam from the boiler powered the dynamo one floor above. And I should add, this is a, this is a picture of an older dynamo um, in the earliest version of the University of Mississippi powerhouse. That was a building that actually burned down in 1907. Faulkner worked in the building that replaced that, um, uh, that, that first powerhouse. And so the dynamo he worked with would have been more modern looking than what I can show you here. But this is the only photograph I've ever found of a dynamo from a University of Mississippi powerhouse. So Faulkner described his work arrangements in a 1932 preface. I got a job in the power plant, he writes, on the night shift from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. as a coal passer. I shoveled coal from the bunker into a wheelbarrow and wheeled it in and dumped it where the firemen could put it in the boiler. About 11 o'clock, the people would be going to bed, and so it did not take so much steam. Then we could rest, the fireman and I. He would sit in a chair and doze. I had invented a table out of a wheelbarrow in, in the coal bunker just beyond a wall from where a dynamo ran. It made a deep, constant humming noise. There was no more work to do until about 4 a.m. when we would have to clean the fires and get up steam again. On these nights, between 12 and 4, I wrote As I Lay Dying in six weeks without changing a word. Published in 1930, As I Lay Dying would seem to reveal little of its genesis in this crucible of petro-modernity that Faulkner's describing. The tale of a poor family's funeral journey from farm to town after the death of the matriarch, the novel features nary a furnace, boiler, or generator. The only thing that happens in a basement is an unwanted sexual encounter that exploits a teenage girl's desperation to terminate her unwanted pregnancy. Cars appear in a single chapter exactly two times. The narrative seems obstinately solar powered as the July heat beats down on the mother's coffin and the surviving husband and children in the town bound mule drawn family wagon. The solar regime is, su is supplemented briefly by the heat and light from a burning barn that son Darrell attempts to improvise into a crematorium for his mother's travestied corpse. There's a brief glimpse of modern electrification in the street lights surrounding the courthouse square in Jefferson but as I lay dying would hardly seem a promising candidate for the growing canon of modernist petro fiction. 
we must look to the novel stylistics rather than its thematics and to the modernity of the imaginative labor that produced it then in order to recover it as a work of petro-modernism. We could start with the dynamo-driven velocity at which Faulkner penned the manuscript over the same six weeks in 1929 during which the stock market crash of October 25th, the very day he began work on his novel, was grinding the nation's financial sector to a halt and plunging the US into the Great Depression. The hum of that generator seems to have supplied the kind of white noise that helped Faulkner screen out the emotional drag of global financial disaster and speed ahead with his account of lives lived and experiences voiced at a fever pitch of intensity. Complementing the speed of the novel's production was its narrative efficiency and streamlined form. At under 57,000 words, As I Lay Dying is easily the shortest Faulkner novel. It's a fast read, or at least it's Faulkner's version of a fast read, as if to make the reading experience mimic the composition process in its fossil-fueled velocity. Faulkner fudged a little bit in claiming not to have changed a word, right? Those dramatic last words, right? Of the passage that I just read you, without changing a word. Faulkner fudged a little bit in claiming not to have changed a word, but an inspection of the holograph manuscript reveals his adherence to the spirit, if not quite the letter of that truth. Among all of his extant novel manuscripts, As I Lay Dying is perhaps the cleanest. Even as they indulge in sporadic flights of stream of consciousness, the 59 short sections of the novel, work of 15 different narrators, mesh with remarkable ease, given the diverse sensibilities responsible for these voices. In a way, this evokes the continuous flow technologies of 20th century's industrial modernity, innovations like the assembly line that became possible only with the coming of electricity to the factory floor, which brings us back to that dynamo to modernity's basement. If the great Faulkner scholar John T. Matthews is right to insist that we read As I Lay Dying in the historical and cultural context of the machine age, it's worth remembering that this era was itself inscribed within the energy systems of petro-modernity. So let's stay with that powerhouse scenario a little longer, but now with an eye toward its politics. In an important book, political scientist Timothy Mitchell, and he was one of the guys on my slide uh, back earlier in the talk, Timothy Mitchell argues that from the vantage point of political power, all modern energy systems are not created equal. Focusing on hydrocarbon infrastructure, Mitchell observes that the subterranean recesses in which coal sequestered itself allowed centuries of miners to work in relative freedom from supervision and to exercise their judgment and technical expertise right there on the site of production. This kind of specialized knowledge and workplace autonomy translated into political clout, the ability for colliers to win concessions from capital and from the state that could improve their quality of life and their working conditions. Other proletarians along coal shipping and distribution pathways, uh, people like teamsters and railway workers, stevedores, and dock employees. They all leverage the threat of work stoppages at coal's strategic choke points to protect their rights and improve their lot as laborers. In coal-rich nations like Great Britain, the US, and Germany, these were among the most effectively organized labor coalitions in history and often the earliest to unionize. Mitchell calls this phenomenon carbon democracy. And he demonstrates at great length how systematically the extraction and transport networks of the emerging petroleum regime were designed to neutralize it, to undo carbon democracy, turning to machines to pump crude from its underground reservoirs and exploiting its liquid properties to ship it through pipelines that could bypass coal's unpredictable intransigent labor forces. Where coal country nurtured populist energies and democratic reforms, oil country paved the way for the inner war and mid-century petro-state, corrupt, authoritarian, plagued by wealth disparities and political unrest. Now on first inspection, Faulkner's powerhouse anecdote would seem to be a great example of the egalitarian politics of Mitchell's carbon, demo uh, carbon democracy. Here's Faulkner, the intrepid passer, 
and his comrade, the fireman, side by side in the coal bunker, unsupervised, resting together when the demand tapers off. Faulkner resting by imagining and inventing great literature, the fireman resting by taking a nap. It's just the sort of coal utopia out of which a novel might emerge to celebrate the determination, plucky independence, and complex interior lives of the working class, tailor-made for the proletarian sympathies of the Depression-era moment. Faulkner's ingenuity in fashioning his work table out of a wheelbarrow maybe the same wheelbarrow into which he had unloaded the coal cars, uh, or actually, yeah, maybe the same wheelbarrow into which he had unloaded the coal cars, allegorizes a carbon politics in which coal becomes the precondition of unalienated manual labor and imaginative work, creative labor. But there's just one problem. Estelle Faulkner told biographer Blotner that her husband would go to work at the powerhouse after dinner immaculate and return home before breakfast, still immaculate. His role at the facility was, according to Blotner, a supervisory one, with two Negroes to do the labor, as Blotner wrote. Faulkner didn't shovel any coal at all, though he would later divide the work of coal passing between himself and this racially unspecified fireman in his anecdote. Actually, concludes Blotner, Faulkner's job involved principally just his being there. This might explain the incongruous reference to that throbbing dynamo just beyond a wall from where Faulkner wrote, rather than beyond the ceiling of the boiler room up on the floor upstairs. It suggests that Faulkner actually composed his novel in the first floor office of the powerhouse, separated from the dynamo room by a wall rather than down in the below ground bunker with the other coal passers. Not so much in modernity's basement then as on its white collar main floor is where As I Lay Dying was born. Beneath the disavowals of this fossil fuel fable, an important relationship is coming into view and one that's under discussed in the energy humanities. Reading between the lines, we can see how fossil modernity in interwar Oxford was inscribed within a racial modernity that was every bit as constitutive of 20th century American life as the modern energy regime was. Thanks to its setting in the US South, that powerhouse episode literally illuminates how racial difference compromises carbon democracy for 20th century Mississippians. Rather than an idyllic glimpse of raceless communion and creative ferment in the coal bunker, we confront a set of spatially differentiated and racially hierarchical work arrangements, an upstairs downstairs drama where black men labor in the basement to produce the amenities of modernity for the whites only university, while the white overseer crafts his latest contribution to global literature a floor above. Modernity's basement and modernity's office thus double as crucibles of American race making. The entanglement of modern racial formations and energy regimes is a major theme of Catherine Yusoff's 2018 study, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, which implicates geology, Yusoff's discipline, the very science that's now patting itself on the back for discovering the Anthropocene in the ecological and racial crises of Atlantic modernity. As Yusoff reveals, the discipline arose out of natural history in large part to help the colonial powers of Europe locate precious mineral resources in Africa and the New World. Moreover, as a science of the inanimate, that's what Yusof calls geology, a science of the inanimate that complemented the work of biology's emergent science of the animate, ensuring up colonialism and slavery, geology provided a set of tools for the reduction of Africans and other subject races from, in, from uh, animate beings to inanimate objects. This is how people can be commodified and geology played a role in that transition. Geology thus participated in the dehumanization of the global populations needed as labor forces, first in the mines and later on the plantations along the commodity frontiers of the Western hemisphere. The industrial scale and extractive intensity of these operations wreaked environmental havoc first in the Americas and then later around the globe as exhaustive agricultural logging and mining enterprises were reproduced elsewhere. 
And when the capitalist world system turned from the kind of metabolic energy sources found in sugar, coffee, cocoa, and tea to more charismatic forms of fossil energy like coal and petroleum beneath the ground, the labor arrangements and the industrial scales of the plantation were reproduced yet again and geology was again there to help. So it's to this regime of limitless wealth accumulation, it's to grow, the growth of capitalism, Yusuf argues, and not to the atmospheric carbon spikes of the Industrial Revolution that we should be tracing the genesis of the Anthropocene epoch that so concerns us now. This era of planetary scale derangement of our Earth's basic life support systems. Yusuf sits, uh, uh, argues then that we must go back to 1492, not to 1784 and the birth of a steam engine or to 1945 and the emergence of nuclear energy if we want to find um, the origin of the Anthropocene. Yusuf's revisionist history works to clarify what Faulkner's selective memory tended to obscure, that racial modernity has troubled fossil fuel modernity from the very beginning. And one sign of this history is the surprisingly unironic way in which chattel slavery came to provide the fossil fuel regime with one of its characteristic units of measurement, the so-called energy slave. This is a term you will see pop up in scholarship and policy writing um, about coal and oil and gas energy ever since the 19th century. Though the term itself wasn't coined until the Cold War era, the analogy was doing important conceptual work significantly earlier than that. In the year 1918, for example, two mineral scientists at the Smithsonian Institute wrote that, quote, to accomplish the work done annually in the United States by fossil fueled machinery would require the labor of three billion hardworking slaves. Now they thought they were writing a kind of sublime discourse about the amazing energy density of these new fuels and all the work they could do. But note this analogy that they're turning to, right? The analogy of how many slaves a barrel of oil might replace, right? Um, or a bunker full of coal. The logic placing subsoil carbon and slaves on a scale of energy equivalence also informed 19th century abolitionist thought. As journalist Andrew Nikiforic has put it, quote, the power generated by the steam engine made slavery redundant in England which as a pioneer in securing work from peat and coal possessed an imperial surplus of energy that after abolition gave England an economic advantage over its imperial rivals. Nikiforic goes on to attribute the profligate use of fossil energy resources in the 19th century and afterward to bad habits of thought and patterns of consumption laid down by slaveholders who recklessly squandered their muscle energy resources. The energy density of inanimate slaves and the extravagance of their owners, Nikiforic writes, reflect not only the cheapness of mechanical slaves' primary fuel, but the legacy of human slavery, which helped legitimate and normalize the overconsumption of energy resources that's still a problem for us in the carbon era. Nikiforic's research documents how the imagination of slavery informed and continues to inform our imagination of hydrocarbons. One of the reasons hydrocarbons seem so easy and effortless for us to waste goes all the way back to the extravagant wasting of slave energy in the 17th and 18th centuries. And with the emergence of post-slavery institutions like convict leasing and prison mines in the South, the deep links between neo-slavery and coal persisted into 20th century America especially at places like Birmingham, Alabama, coal and steel country, or Brushy Mountain, Tennessee, where a coal mine turned in uh, to a prison. Faulkner's formative years in the turn of the century South would have given him a unique vantage point on the racial dimensions of fossil fuel modernity. So in this last little section, I'm gonna shift gears from uh, coal to oil and tell you a little bit about a place I'm gonna call modernity's garret modernity's attic instead of modernity's basement. One curious text from the Faulkner oeuvre attempts to imagine something like modernity's attic, an aesthetic space also informed in explicit ways by fossil fuels, this time around oil. Faulkner published Carcassonne in his first story collection, These 13, in 1931, 
having apparently been unable to place the story with the national magazines or even in a literary journal. He gave this brief visionary tale among the shortest he ever published. Well, I should have, I should have silenced my phone, shouldn't I? Sorry about that. Let me back up. Faulkner published Carcassonne in uh, 1931 after apparently uh, having been unable to place the story with the national magazines or even in a literary journal. He gave this brief visionary tale among the shortest he ever published, kind of his As I Lay Dying among short stories, the anchor position in that collection. And that's a move he would repeat in 1950 with his collected stories volume. So that's a 900 page volume of short stories in which Carcassonne gets the anchor position. The story undoubtedly held great personal significance for him. In its elliptical imagery, bold metaphor, and elusive style can be found numerous motifs that will resurface in major novels like The Sound and the Fury, As I Lay Dying, and Light in August. As such, Carcassonne is something like a fountainhead for Faulkner's distinctive brand of interwar literary modernism, a hub of what critic Robert Hamblin has called Faulkner's geography of the imagination. To which I would add, Carcassonne is a fable of an artistic sensibility that has been thoroughly circumscribed and fundamentally enabled by petroleum. That's a big claim, so I'm going to spend my last few minutes trying to make it good. Where is the oil in modernism? Critic Joshua Schuster asks in a provocative 2007, 2017 essay. Oil, Schuster elaborates, is everywhere during the modernist era changing the shape of the landscape with cars, roads, airplanes, military equipment, and spawning suburbs, intensifying land speculation and commodity trading, further mechanizing agriculture and producing new chemicals and plastics. But oil rarely appears directly in modernist art. Now those are Schuster's words. Though it spreads across the globe at the same time as modernist culture, and though its effects spread inexorably into the conscious and unconscious, begging to be leered at in forms of spectacle and conspicuous consumption, oil manages nonetheless to resist visibility. As such, Schuster continues, while oil has modernism, modernity, and the slash between the two written all over it, to read oil in modernism is necessarily to read obliquely and after erasure or expenditure. So how can we explain this gap between modernism and modernity? To which I would answer, to close this gap, we need look no farther than Carcassonne. To the extent that this story has a plot at all, it concerns an unnamed would-be poet who washes up in a port city named Rincon, presumably somewhere in the tropical latitudes of Spanish America. The protagonist has bummed a room above a local cantina where he knows the bartender, and in this garret, he sleeps beneath, quote, an unrolled strip of tarred roofing and dreams of literary greatness. Rincon is an oil company town, the Standard Oil Company, to be precise, and we remember their family connections, right, in the Faulkner family with Standard Oil. It's the epitome of the modern multinational corporation extending its global reach into new markets and resource frontiers, places out there on the on the rim of the hemisphere like Rincon. When it comes to petroleum, we never learn whether Rincon and its parent state are buying or selling, whether this is a production center or uh, whether this is a refining or distribution site. But the crisis of the story lies in the way the oil company also extends its reach into the life of the mind through the patronage of the Standard Oil Company's wife, and that's Faulkner's phrasing, the Standard Oil Company's wife. Mrs. Widrington, who appears to have made the young poet one of her projects. It was Ms. Widrington's darkness he was using to sleep in, writes Faulkner, since Standard owned the garret and the roofing paper as well as the night. She'd make a poet of you too, Faulkner continues, if you did not work anywhere. With her, if you were white and did not work, you were either a tramp or a poet. Maybe you were. It's not so much the woman's racialized assumptions that bother our aspiring poet, so much as it is the intrusive form of support she offers. Wealthy people have to own so many things, he sarcastically observes to himself. Only she didn't expect the rats to pay for using her darkness and silence 
by writing poetry. He resents the terms of their relationship. He resents the support right, that she gives him, but he does not reject it. In his predicament, we glimpse the dilemma of the artist in the era of big capital, and more specifically, the era of big oil, the corporate largesse that funds museums and presses, foundations, fellowships, and prizes. In Rincon, the literary arts have taken a distinctly oily turn, which finds its emblem in that tar paper beneath which the poet sleeps, wrapping his dreams, the wellsprings of aesthetic vision and poetic inspiration in the tack and stink of asphaltum. Now, the desire to evade the mark of this particular tar brush clearly informs the poet's ambitions. I wanna perform something bold and tragical and austere, he tells himself, and he beats back the intimations of mortality unhelpfully voiced by his skeleton. His skeleton is another actual like major character in Carcassonne. It, um, it presumably puts the carcass in Carcassonne. So he beats back the intimations of mortality voiced by his skeleton with fantasies of transcendence, of which one in particular stands out for the persistence with which it recurs across the story. The poet, quote, on a buckskin pony with eyes like blue electricity and a mane like tangled fire galloping up the hill and right off into the high heaven of the world. When it comes to willfully liberating the imagination from the base considerations of filthy standard oil lucre, you could do worse than ride up a piled silver hill of cumuli on a soaring steed. It's as if the poet thunders up the long blue hill of heaven on a Pegasus, the mythic winged mount of Greek mythology. This airborne pony may evoke in its own oblique way the coming of the aviation age, when the internal combustion in engine and big oil's commitment to refining petroleum into gasoline finally allowed the horsepower latent in these new energy dense fuels quite literally to take flight, to leave the earth behind. This is oil made over from what a former OPEC official called the devil's excrement in the 1970s gushing out of the earth to contaminate the ground and water on its surface, oil made over into something sleek, streamlined, clean, airborne, and quintessentially modern, bold and austere, as Faulkner writes. The aspiring poet of Carcassonne envisions himself in almost precisely the same way that the combat aces of World War I had been imagined in the period consciousness and in much interwar literature as well as a kind of medieval knight of the air, aloft and ethereal on his mechanized mount. Along the way, and no doubt without realizing it, he's also sublimating the devil's excrement into something more like an energy ambrosia. Faulkner though uses this Pegasus image to clip the poet's wings, to check his fantasies of creative emancipation and transcendence at the instant of their conception. For in drawing on the Pegasus vision to imagine his way out of the grip of standard oil, the young poet is ironically imagining himself right back into it. In the dreamer's day, as in Faulkner's, Pegasus wasn't just a mythological creature. It was also a corporate logo. First trademarked in 1911 by the Vacuum Oil Company, a manufacturer of lubrication oil founded in New York in 1866. In 1879, John D. Rockefeller had acquired the company as part of the swelling Standard Oil Trust and Vacuum's indictment for violations of interstate commerce laws in 1907 was a big part um, of the court-ordered breakup as a rationale for the court-ordered breakup of the Standard Trust in 1911. At that point, Vacuum became an independent oil company once again and developed that Pegasus logo that you see here to distinguish and market itself. In 1929, according to Mississippi oil historian Doug, Dudley Hughes, the company was among those listed for business in the state as oil and gas exploration picked up. Vacuum, however, would return to the standard fold when it merged with Standard Oil of New York or Saucony in 1931 the year that Faulkner published his story. So this Pegasus logo would have been very much in the business and financial news in the same year that Faulkner is bringing out his tale. The Pegasus logo has enjoyed a long and storied life since then. 
1934, the city of Dallas erected a rotating 35 by 40 foot red neon Pegasus. I'm kind of circling it here with the cursor. A red neon Pegasus atop the 29 story headquarters of the Magnolia Oil Company. Now, Magnolia had ironically been a former rival of Vacuum, but by 1934, it was a sister company under the Saucony banner. Standard had acquired both companies. Another neon Pegasus was exhibited prominently at the 1939 World's Fair in New York. Saucony Vacuum became Saucony Mobile in 1955, which became Mobile Oil Corporation in 1966, and as if to resurrect the trust, merged with Exxon, the former Standard Oil Company of New Jersey, in 1999. To this day, the Pegasus logo can still be seen on mobile brand products within the Exxon Mobile conglomerate. The fact that Carcassonne's most important example of a highbrow poetic image, all right, that pony galloping off Pegasus like into the sky. The fact that Carcassonne's most important example of high modernist difficulty should cite the trademark of an energy company making headlines the very same year that the story first appeared in print attests to the timeliness of Faulkner's fable of the work of art in the era of post in the era of um, petro modern reproduction. Where's the oil in modernism? Joshua Schuster asked. In Carcassonne, Pegasus marks the spot. The tale thus points self-reflexively to an author who recognizes his own vocation as thoroughly entangled by the 1920s in a fossil fuel unconscious and economy. The Faulkner of Carcassonne sees that U.S. neocolonialism will subsidize 20th century culture, as John T. Matthews has written. But there's even more to it than that. Faulkner also sees that by the 1920s, if not well before, big oil carries a colonizing force all its own, an imperialist logic of expansion and domination that was to a significant degree becoming independent of the modern state, or even arguably coming to be constitutive of the modern state. No contemporary nation state or colonial territory is ever named in Carcassonne, not the US, not the state or colony where Rincon is to be found. That explicit naming function is reserved only for the world's largest corporation at the time. Standard Oil is called out by name in that story. No nation is called out by name. The story thus hints at its own subsidization as a literary artifact by what Matthews calls the new corporate compulsions of Standard Oil and other modern energy conglomerates. So in conclusion, you'll be glad to know. In conclusion, like Faulkner, we live in an era characterized by anticipation and trepidation about energy transitions whether the ones that scientists and green activists are now calling for or the ones likely to be forced on us if we ignore their call. As scholars in the energy humanities keep reminding us, it took two centuries for the global north to imagine its way into petromodernity, to develop the narratives and metaphors, images, and other conceptual resources that enabled it. It took a lot of thinking then to render our current energy order unremarkable, commonsensical, to place it below the level of conscious reflection and assessment. And it will take no less thinking to prepare the way for and then smooth the transition into the next order. By learning how previous societies like Faulkner South negotiated their energy transitions and how artists like Faulkner imagined their energy systems, we can learn from them, putting ourselves in better position to proceed mindfully with our own transitions. Like the literary record, like the Faulkner oeuvre, the energy humanities will be ready to help. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, um, Jay. Betty Jo, did you have any questions? Yes, I have um, a question. Is, is there currently an energy transition occurring in the U.S.? And if so, who do you know that is currently writing about such a transition? Is that started? 
Well, I, I think we are, you know, fitfully trying to begin a transition beyond the complete dominance of fossil fuels toward a whole variety, you can't point to one other energy system, but to a whole other uh, variety of energy systems that are going to be needed to replace coal, oil, and gas. So certainly I think wind and water, um, even nuclear, whatever you think about that, is coming back into the conversation as at least from a carbon standpoint, a clean form of energy. So we are in an era that is trying to think its way out from under coal, oil, and gas um, into other forms. How is this thinking being done um, in contemporary literature? Well, in part, I think, well, for one thing, we've got a kind of apocalyptic literature that is trying to imagine the end of oil in some ways as the end of the world. That's acknowledging how difficult it's going to be um, for us to change everything about our world to accommodate new ways of sustaining it and fueling it. So you can think about a novel like Cormac McCarthy's The Road um, as a novel that wants to remind us of how, you know, I mean, of how urgent uh, these transitions are and how high the, high the stakes are behind them. Um, and then, I don't know, have, do we have the great wind novel or the great solar novel? Um, I think a lot of environmental writing more generally, including Southern environmental writing, tries to imagine its way back to a more sort of organic and holistic um, solar energy regime that combines wind and water, sun, uh, human muscles, tries to return some dignity and value to work. Uh, which slavery devalued uh, by turning human beings into energy sources. I think if you think a lot of a lot of environmental fiction and the way it experiments with off the grid um, kinds of lives and kinds of imaginations, this is a start, right? This is a start um, imagining our way forward. Uh, this isn't just a kind of nostalgic, you know, backward glance at where we used to be. Um, it's a really, it's an urgent glance forward at where we're going to need to be. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I know as um, a mother, I read uh, stories aloud to my children and one that we particularly enjoyed together was um, Kenneth Graham's Wind in the Willows. And I think of, uh, you know, Toad in the motor car and, and how, what a crazy character he was uh, in the future. And so sometimes I think some of this writing that we're experiencing, like when you say the road, it's almost a futuristic look. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, you know, you have pointed out that Faulkner was very current, you know, in his writing uh, about what was going on in the country. Um, really great uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, Emily, are there any more questions from your end? I think that's it. Um, that was really fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Betty Jo, for being here to introduce. Um, again, I will post a survey link in the comments. We will be asking for surveys throughout. And I hope everybody tunes back in for the remainder of the conference. We'll be back tomorrow at 1030. And again, Jay, thank you so much. And Betty Jo, thank you.